Dr. Michael Speaks. Uh, Dr. Speaks is Dean of Syracuse University School of Architecture, a program founded way back in uh, 1873. An internationally respected scholar and recognized leader in design education, as well as author of a series of essays on design intelligence, uh, Dr. Speaks has lectured and published widely on the subject of art, architecture, urbanism, and urban design. Born in America's Deep South, Dr. Speaks earned a BA in English from the University of Mississippi and a PhD in literature from Duke University. Previously, Dr. Speaks was Dean of the College of Design at the University of Kentucky and Director of the Graduate Program at the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles. Dr. Speaks has taught at Yale University School of Art and in the architecture programs at Harvard, Columbia, the University of Michigan, UCLA, the Berlage, and TU Delft, among others. Founding editor at, of uh, Polygraph and former editor at ENI, uh, Dr. Speaks is a former contributing editor for the architectural record and has served on the editorial advisory board of Japan's AU magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Speaks. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we have a seminar here. Uh, I, I, this time of year, um, I saw uh, your administrator out doing what I do this time of year, which is trying to guilt students into coming into the lecture. Uh, I, I, I do the same thing every week. It's, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It, it's, uh, it's terrific to be here. I, uh, I refused to wear that uh, ear thing, uh, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna hold this microphone and, and, and try to give my lecture. This is why things are spread out all over the place here. Uh, so apologies for holding this uh, microphone um, and not complying with normal procedure and putting the earpiece on, but I, I didn't think I would be able to concentrate with that thing uh, kind of wound around my head like a slinky. Um, in any case, uh, it's great to be here. I haven't been to Toronto in a while. Uh, and very happy uh, uh, to be here at Ryerson. Never been uh, to the university, nor to the School of Architecture. Got a tour earlier. Um, great school, love, love to come back. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and let's get on with it. So, uh, I, I I, I have a, a lecture with four numbers uh, as the title. You, you probably all know about these four numbers because they're, they're dates. And I'll talk about them in different ways at different times um, and through the lecture. What, what, uh, what I will like to do is mostly speak. Uh, my name is Michael Speaks, after all. I, I love to talk, and I will talk a lot. But I also... Uh, will read a little bit toward the end. Uh, I don't like to read, but I write so beautifully that I would hate to deprive you of an opportunity to hear me read some of my beautiful text as well. <clears throat> I can also hold my thoughts better uh, if I read just a little bit at the end. So, um, so what I want to talk about, and I know uh, some of the graduate students went to Venice this just recently, I'm curious, how many, are, how many graduate students are here who went to Venice? Um, you all saw, obviously saw Rum Cole House's uh, Venice Biennale. Um, I'm sure you enjoyed it. Uh, it's huge, comprehensive, took a long time uh, to put together, normal, longer than normal, and certainly takes a long time to see it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, but mostly I want to talk about um, how that Biennale, in my view, um, let's say, signals not only the end of Rem Koolhaas's career, but it signals the end of a certain kind of, um, let's say, avant-garde practice of architecture globally. Um, and I think it's, uh, and, 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 and I say this, and I want to talk about this, because um, 
Reb Kohlhaus, for me, like many people, has been uh, you know, an important uh, figure in architecture culture and personally. I spent a lot of time in Holland. I, I lived uh, in Holland. I was a researcher at the TU Delft. Uh, I lived there for two years in Rotterdam and I spent about 10 years going back and forth to Holland quite a lot. So I know, I know the culture well. I did a lot of exhibits there. Uh, in the early 90s, spent a lot of time uh, there, really before Holland became huge. And then, um, of course, it, uh, you know, it, it, it fell on economic hard times, um, let's say, in the middle 2000s. Um, but so I know the culture well. And, uh, and for many years, I, I viewed uh, Rem Kohlhaus, like many people do, as, as a kind of uh, marker for a certain kind of avant-garde practice. Um, and for me, it, it had a lot to do with uh, the way in which I think Rem Kohlhaus reimagined the, the significance of architecture um, in a very important way, not to be so much uh, focused on architecture and what it is or what its essence is, but I think for a very long time, Rem uh, focused his attention on and helped us focus our attention on what architecture can do. Not what it is, but, but what can it do, which is a kind of a more urbanistic way of thinking about architecture as a form of practice. Um, I, I, for a very long time, imagined OMA and REM's practice in general as a non-ideological practice, but I think this exhibition um, really puts a, a punctuation point on the, um, on the fact that, in fact, it is a, an ideological practice. And for that reason, I, I find it uh, not only uncompelling, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of model of practice that I, I believe uh, has many, many wrong assumptions about the world. Um, one of them is that modernization is a singular, linear um, uh, process that starts in the West and that spreads like peanut butter around the world uniformly. That's one of the assumptions, I think, of the, of the Venice Biennale. Um, I think one of the other uh, assumptions uh, that REM has made, I think, but I think only now do we see it with, uh, with the Venice Biennale fully, um, has to do with an interesting relationship between thinking and doing in architecture. One of the signal, for, for me, one of the really remarkable things about the practice of OMA and about Rem's writing in general and about the intellectual project that he laid out um, uh, is that it was decidedly not a vanguard practice uh, in the way modernism was. Rem did not lay out a 10 points uh, or a system, uh, a utopian blueprint for the future. In fact, he discovered in Manhattan a logic called the culture of congestion that he wrote in the form of a book called uh, Delirious New York that became the foundation, I think, for their practice to this day. Um, and I think that, I think a one word kind of uh, designates that practice or that, that um, mm, yeah, that focus, uh, bigness, uh, which is an essay that he wrote um, some years after, after he, he wrote Delirious New York. Anyway, so that's what I want to talk about. Um, uh, what, I, what I want to say before I say it all, uh, this is like the preface to the book, but if it were really a good preface, you wouldn't have to read the book. If I just told you what I'm going to say, then you wouldn't have to listen to me say what I'm going to say. But I'll say a short version of it, which is that um, I, th I, think, uh, I think Kohlhaus's practice is marked uh, as a practice of the past, I think uh, largely due to his views on modernization, and I think largely viewed, uh, due to the fact that, um, that the practice is an ideological one, very much like Zaha's practice, uh, which is marked by the most unfortunate term uh, uh, that has been delivered uh, uh, to us by Patrick Schumacher in one of the most awful books, I think, ever written, uh, called Parametricism. Um, the only more unfortunate thing than the book is that the fact that there are four more volumes published, uh, promised. Um, 
I think I think that's an ideology. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to this in a second. So so what I want what I there are two things I want to try to talk about. One is REM is an example of something that I think is very bad, yeah. And I want to tell you why I think it's bad. But what I want to do is to lay out a kind of short history of where we were, where we are, and where we might be going, and why it is that REM is not going there or taking us there. Um, and I want to do that uh, by looking at something that seems hyper-intellectual, but is in fact very much, I think, part of what I saw happening in this building earlier. And that has to do with the relationship between thinking and doing. What is the relationship between thought and action, between the mind and the hand, between uh, concepts and built form? What is it? Um, I, think, I think if we look at the history of the, of the from, let's say, from the late 19th century uh, to the middle part of the 20th century to now, we can retrace a history of transformation of the different relationships between thinking and doing in architecture. And I'm gonna talk about that in historical terms as ideals, ideology, and intelligence. Um, so, now I'm done, I don't have to do my talk, no. Um, okay, so uh, four, four dates, uh, 1968, Big year, May 1968, everybody knows that. Um, 1989, some interesting things happened then. 2008 and 2014, okay. Okay, move. This thing is, ah, okay. So, uh, May 1968. May 1968, you know, happened in May, of course, it happened in 1968, but it happened in 67 in Tokyo, it happened in, in, in Italy, it happened Around the world, it's the you know it was the moment when uh, in Paris, obviously, uh, uh, when uh, student movements uh, really took power, uh, if only briefly, uh, pushed the government to the edge. Um, really, we see the emergence of street culture, student uh, culture, um, and also in, in a, you know the end really of the Beaux Arts system in architecture. Uh, we see the rise, or we also see in a sense, the end of modernism in philosophical terms and in, I think in, in architectural terms uh, in 68. It's also, uh, it marks a year in which many of the people from that moment going forward, um, we all view as heroes and as part of the avant-garde. In fact, I skipped over a slide, I hope I did. I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I'll just do it like this, it's easier. Um, this is, a, so this is how this was supposed to start. Um, this is a picture of someone uh, uh, with whom I agree on almost nothing, uh, Peter Eisenman, except for this single thing that he says about uh, Rem Kohlhaus's uh, Venice Biennale of 2014. Um, and he says so, I think, mostly because he's jealous, uh, but in fact, I think what he says is true. He says, in 68, we found out what the future was gonna be, the revolution in 68, and the schools and culture and art all was changed. We are now 50 years from 64, and the totemic figure of these 50 years, the symbolic figure, Rem Koolhaas, right? <laughs> um, yes, he's right. Um, Rem Koolhaas presents the Biennale as the end, the end of my career, the end of my hegemony, the end of my mythology, the end of everything, the end of architecture. Um, now, you guys went to the exhibit, you wouldn't think that, because in fact, the exhibit is about fundamentals. It's about what really, what is architecture? It's a kind of search for what is the essence of architecture. So in a, in a funny way, um, uh, this may or may not be the case, but, or, or at least this end of architecture, I would disagree with. But I do think, I do think Eisenman is onto something. I think the Biennale does mark the end of a period of intellectual, architectural culture that begins in 68 with a number of very important figures. And Kohlhaas maybe, uh, I would say, <clears throat> is, is surely the most important of those. So, 68, as I was, as I was just saying, you know, marks the end of the Beaux-Arts. It, it also marks the end of, in, in Europe, marks the end of systematic continental philosophy. You know, it's the rise of all the stuff that we came to know as theory later, or you know, theory in general. All of the, uh, you know, Foucault, Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, the whole, world emerges, or that world really emerges in 68, or out of 68. So 68 is an important year. 
89 is an interesting year as well. And uh, 89, of course, is the, is, and I put this book up because it couldn't have been more wrong. And the assumptions made in this book, I think, are, are assumptions that are not unlike the ones that Rem makes. Of course, in, 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 in this year, we have the, the fall, you know, uh, the Berlin Wall comes down. We're at the 25th anniversary of that. Um, we also had uh, Tiananmen Square. Um, but we also had this book, The, uh, the End of History and the, and the Last Man. None of you, certainly none of you students, would have any idea uh, that this was uh, an important book at one time. The, the, the assertion of this book, it's written by a guy named Francis Fukuyama, really interesting person, um, uh, a, a student, I believe, of Samuel Huntington's. Uh, I, I, the, the, the thesis of the book is that the West uh, invented liberal democracy and it's a category into which all political systems will eventually evolve. So it's there, it's been there from the beginning. So the West has gotten there and we're waiting for the rest of the world to get there. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, Tiananmen spells a different story, um, we're beginning to see how the rest of the world will conform to this, to, to this uh, form of government called liberal democracy. And the idea basically is the West invented this, and every other country will soon emerge and live into this category called liberal democracy. It, of course, has not turned out to be the case. Um, 2008, of course, is the year in which the stock market came crashing down. Um, uh, but it's also the year of the Beijing Olympics. And it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting marker because in some ways if you could say that modernism ends in 68 which i would say if you, if you i think you could say that 89 is the last false promise that the west uh, invented everything and that everything else would conform to it this is a sure fire guarantee that the world is being reorganized uh, in economic and cultural terms um, and if you watch the beijing olympics on tv in 2008 and you saw the buildings and all that was produced there um, you knew that the power, uh, that global power had shifted um, away from uh, Western Europe and North America. And 2014 uh, is, of course, the year of uh, the, the, you know, the crowning of Rem Koolhaas and the end, in my view, of his influence. Um, it's also the 100-year anniversary of World War I, which in some senses is the first real expression of modernization on a global, on a global scale. So I'm going to play around with these dates as I, as I go through. One of the things I want to say about, about, the, about REMS Venice Biennale is that it's part, uh, it's, for me, what's disappointing about it, I mean, there are many things disappointing about it, um, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this later. Um, but one of the things that's disappointing about it is that this exhibition is, in, is engaged in a similar kind of um, um, speculation about contemporary architecture that many, many others are engaged in right now. There is a, um, a widespread um, worry that we are no longer doing real architecture anymore. And no one really even knows what that is. If you look at some of the more, let's say, um, highbrow kinds of intellectual journals and architectural culture, they are all stock taking. They are all reassessing. What are we doing? What really, you know, how, if you look at the, if you look at contemporary practice, if you look at what's happening in schools, um, it's not clear that anybody knows what direction we are taking. It's not clear that there is any kind of dominant. It's not clear that anybody even cares if there is. Um, and so um, there has been an enormous amount over the last three or four years of what occurred in this log 2013. This is basically, this issue was devoted to Eisenman going around asking all of his friends, why the hell don't we teach history in schools of architecture anymore? I mean, he interviewed everybody he knew to ask them that, and they, none of them seemed to really know why. Um, but, uh, but not only uh, any, if you, look, if you look at the last three issues of the Harvard Design Magazine, they all focused on the core. What is the core of architecture? What's the essence, what's the center 
of architecture? What's the center of landscape architecture? What's the center of planning? Each of the, each of the last three issues is this kind of excruciating inward look as if no one knows to determine what is architecture? What is it? Um, we, have, we seem to have lost it with, in software or digital fabrication or, you know, this is the speculation. Why don't we teach history anymore? Why don't people know fundamentals? So there is a weird fundamentalism, I think, that is occurring in a lot of schools of architecture and a lot of thinkers right now, looking backward, looking, looking backward and inside to try to discover what is the essence? What really is architecture about? I always admired Cole House's um, ability to swerve or completely um, uh, refuse to answer that question, what is architecture? And in fact, focus instead on what it can do. What is its operationality? What does it do in the world? Not philosophically, what is it? Um, in any case, um, one of my disappointments with the, with, the, with, the, with the Biennale is that, in fact, that's precisely what OMA, that's precisely what REM seems to have focused on in this exhibition. Fundamentals. So there, 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 there are two big things, I think, that happen uh, in, the, in the exhibition that, that I believe are problematic. One um, is this obsession with fundamentals themselves. And it's, I guess it's, it's a kind of a catalog of a show. It's the 12 essential elements that Rim has determined are the elements. Um, um, but, and, it's, and it's in some ways an incredibly architectural, but also an incredibly boring uh, exhibit. You, you all who just went probably uh, could say more about that than I could. Um, in any case, this, this focus on essence, on what architecture is on fundamentals, seems very un-avant-garde or non-avant-garde and seems very un-REM-like, uh, in, in, in my view at least. Um, the, other, the other problem with it, um, I think, is this assertion, um, as I suggested earlier, that modernization is a linear process that starts in the West and that spreads around the world and that, do, and that spreads the same kind of thing all all around the world. Um, one, of the, one of the images or one of the lecture pieces that Rem used in presenting this initially is to say, if we look in 1914 at Germany, China, Switzerland, Italy, France, Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, on and on, you see that these all were distinct and different. They all were different one from the other. And what he says is that if you look at these same, same countries today, what you see is that they all have succumbed to a kind of global modernization where everything looks the same, everything is uh, the same style, everything's built probably by the same firms with the same three or four letters. Uh, so, so, but, so the, but the problem with this, I think, uh, is his, this view of modernization is wrong. It's a, it's a view of modernization that's linear and that believes that the West invented everything and that it all simply spreads in a uniform way like it's paced around the world. And it's just a matter of time until it gets to, um, until it's spread everywhere. So, uh, you know, uh, this is, these, are just, these are just pages from the catalog, um, you know, all of which are, again, focusing on this, obsession with the essence of architecture. What is architecture? Um, the, o the other thing that, 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 I, I wanted, that I would like to say uh, about the exhibition, or what, what I think the exhibition makes clear, is that, is that um, the model of, let's say, the experimental model of um, design and concept generation that Cole House developed very, very early on is one that he took from Salvador Dali. I'm sure you all know something about that, or probably you know everything about it. Um, the paranoid critical method. And it's a method in which you view um, normal reality uh, in such a way that you push certain logics to extremes, and you surface things 
that wouldn't have been there had you not pushed the logics uh, of things that you discover to extremes. Um, if, you look at, if you look at Delirious New York, uh, Rem's uh, you know, most famous um, publication, which he wrote uh, while he was a fellow at the IAUS uh, in, in New York uh, that Eisenman uh, founded and, and, and ran, um, what you see is that, is that here in this analysis of Manhattan, Kohlhaas discovers really the logic I think of his entire practice from that, that drives the practice from this, from this moment forward. And it's a logic that, that combines an analysis of the grid system um, and uh, the coupling of the grid system with the elevator in a tall building that enables uh, for him um, a unified uh, system with the grid, but each block has its own incredibly high degrees of freedom. So each block is free and distinct, like its own world, and, but it's, they all conform to the grid. And each of, in, in, and in each of the buildings, because of the elevator, um, you can have on the 15th floor something completely different than what you have on the second floor, or the 18th floor, or the 34th floor. So these two technologies, the grid and the elevator, are both constricting, but they also open up infinite degrees of freedom. Now, what's, it's, it's, it's a brilliant book. I love it. I think it's a fantastic book. It is really the basis, however, I think of all of Kohlhaas's practice. And I think the significant thing about it for me now um, is that this is not, it's very unlike modernism in that Rem did not lay down 10 principles. He discovered principles that already existed in Manhattan in this analysis, and then he leveraged those to create a model for a practice that's driven then by a concept that comes from this called bigness. So, and these are just, these are just, uh, and, and if, you, if, you look, if you look at uh, projects going forward, I mean, for example, the first big competition that they win after this is the Parc de la Villette uh, in Paris, which they won two times, but they still gave the project to Bernard Chumi. Um, so be careful when you win, you actually don't always get to. It's, it's probably, I think, the, it's one of the most incredible projects they ever did. Um, but in a sense, it's kind of like one of those, it's, it's, it's like the structure that he analyzes uh, in Manhattan. It's like a tall building laid over on its side with infinite kind of degrees of freedom programmed in a very, very complicated uh, grid system. And the same is true with a lot of the big buildings, built and non-built, that, that get developed after this. These are all driven by this principle of bigness. This is the Zeebrugge Maritime Terminal. Um, you know, these, these are all, of course, very famous buildings. I just visited this building about three weeks ago. What, what you begin to see as we get later and later in REM's uh, building career is that it, it becomes an absolutely seemingly kind of cynical expression and this is the most I, I think monstrous and although I love it I, I absolutely love this building and I and I have, and I love the Shenzhen uh, Stock Exchange as well but they become almost caricatures of this of this concept of bigness that is not produced or invented by Rim but that is discovered in Manhattan his manifest, it, you may recall the, the subtitle of Delirious New York is, um, um, does anybody remember the subtitle? Has anybody read the book? A Retroactive Manifesto, which is a very interesting and weird subtitle. A Retroactive Manifesto is one that doesn't have to be written. It's a manifesto that actually has already been, has already been produced because, and there's plenty of evidence for it in Manhattan. So you simply take the existing world as your manifesto, and you extrapolate that. What it basically means is that Rem didn't invent a manifesto. This is what distinguishes him from modernism, and I think it's, what's, it's quite terrific. But I think it's also what limits him, and I'm going to suggest why I think that is. Okay, sorry for these uh, charts, but I, I think they're, uh, well, they're important for me. Um, 
I, I would, what I would like to suggest is that there is a, there is a kind of a historical progression we could follow. Um, and for many, for a long time, I had the idea that Rem Kohlhaas and OMA were trending in this direction. Uh, now I, I'm, I'm convinced by the Venice Biennale that they belong here. Like almost all of the architects of the postmodern period, whose interest really was principally in overturning modernism and replacing it with a substitute. And I think, and I'll show some of those in a second, and you will recognize many of these. But this is a kind of a shorthand um, historical structure that for me is very helpful in thinking through where we've been, where we are, and where we might be going. Not just in economic terms, but also in terms of thought in terms of, uh, in terms, let's say, of an intellectual dominant that really is driven by these economic changes. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go through this in great detail, but I, I, what I do wanna talk about is just a kind of an outline of how, of, of how I see this. If we, if we think of modernity, and you can say that modernity begins, you know, in 44 BC, you could say it begins with the Greeks, you could say it begins in, in the Renaissance, I think for many people, I think you, you, could, you could make a very strong argument that it begins in the 18th century. What I would like to say is it begins in the 18th century, it ends in the 1960s. It's a linear, spatial kind of view of, of, of modernization. It's one where, uh, where modernization takes the form of internationalization. The principal drivers are nation states, which provide security against risk. There, it's an industrial paradigm. It's one that produces goods, um, and the, the, and I'll go back. So 60s to the 90s, I, 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 I wanna say like many people, is the period of post-modernity. It's a linear model, but it's also a, t it's a temporal, temporally driven model. Um, it's one where, the for where, where modernization takes the form of multinationalization. Multinational corporations replace nation states. Um, those also provide security, but for employees against risk. It's a post-industrial paradigm, uh, and services are the principal products. What I would like to say is that really since the 1990s, uh, a very different paradigm emer started to emerge, um, and it was a paradigm that's nonlinear and that is not really uh, interested in space or time, but it's about speed instead. It's about speed. Um, and this is, a, this is a paradigm, I would argue, in which the modernization takes the form of globalization, where nation states and multinational states give way to market states, states that actually operate more like companies and corporations. Um, and those market states no longer have interest in providing security for citizens or for employees. They simply provide opportunity for innovation, and that's it. No security whatsoever. You innovate or you disappear. That's, that's, that's the principle of the market state. Um, it's an informational economy and it's one driven by knowledge. What I also want to say is that, is that each of these has parallel intellectual paradigms that have an enormous amount to do, I think, with architecture and with ar how architecture is conceived, made, and written and thought about. Um, uh, the modernist paradigm is one that's driven by philosophy, classical understanding uh, of, of thought, which, uh, whose ambition is to discover the true or the essence of things, um, and is, is always to uh, move aside the falsity uh, of surface things and discover something true below it. It's a kind of a hermeneutical model. In the 60s through the 90s, this paradigm, this philosophical paradigm, really beginning in 68, uh, is, is um, replaced by a paradigm that many called theory. It's a paradigm where you, go, you, know, you move from, from Hegel and Husserl and Heidegger to Michel Foucault and Luce Irigaray and uh, Gilles Deleuze, et cetera, et cetera. It's one where instead of discovering the true, the ambition is to, is to uncover the repressed true. It's one where essence is replaced by simulacra. It's one where the old-fashioned false true hermeneutical depth model 
is replaced in such a way that there really is nothing here anymore. There are no originary truths. And I want to say we, we have started to live in a very different paradigm where these things no longer obtain. It's a paradigm driven by knowledge, but it's one um, that's really principally about intelligence, where knowledge where, and the practice of intelligence, or, and the practice is not to discover a true or to uncover or repress, but to transform chatter, lots and lots and lots of information into actionable knowledge, into plausible truths that you can do things with. Which means the interest in things that are tr absolutely true or things that are interested in critiquing that and finding another, an alternative version of the truth are no longer relevant. They're over with. So this blue paradigm, I believe, is the one that we live in now. Um, and how does this play out in architecture? Um, I think it plays out along these lines that I want to call ideals, ideology, and intelligence. Um, and they correspond to these same periods, philosophy, theory, and intelligence. So the ideals. The ideals of modernism, modernism was looking for absolute universal truth. Um, and, the, and, and of course, uh, you know, we know the modernists are searching for those truths in ancient times, in, uh, in classical geometries like these. Yeah, so these are the ideals of modernism. And then in the, from the 60s to the 90s, you, you see the, the ideals of modernism get replaced by the ideologies of postmodernism. Um, and, and, and in essence, really what, uh, what these ideologists are interested in is criticizing, let's say, the, ide the ideals and universal truths of modernism mm, and replacing them with a variety of ideologies. So, uh, and it's a very vigorous, exciting, crazy time. Peter Eisenman versus Leon, my ideology is better than yours. So the period of 60s to the 90s is a period of ideology, a period where the, where the truths, the ideals of modernism are critiqued and overturned, and the argument is that you have many versions of these. So, so Portuguese's 1980 exhibition at the Venice Biennale lays out one of those, postmodernism, deconstructivism, complexity and contradiction, folding in architecture. Uh, the most horrible of all, of course, is the Patrick Schumacher uh, ideology of parametricism, a terrible, horrible thing, horrible thing. Um, let me go back to this. It, so so it, it, what, what I want to argue is that ideals, ideology, and intelligence line up with these paradigms. Just so that, so that now everyone has a theory of ideology, but I want to I uh, just refer to, I, I kind of an interesting uh, book written, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago by a moral philosopher um, uh, at Princeton University uh, who, who talks about three different characters. Uh, and I think these parallel beautifully with the ideals and the ideology, and then what I'm going to call intelligencers. I don't know how many people have read this book. It's actually a spectacular book. It's called On Bullshit. And, um, and, and it's a moral philosopher from Princeton. So it's a serious guy. It's a serious book. And it's a very compelling and interesting book. And he makes some distinctions that I think are absolutely crucial. And this is the book. Has anybody read the book here? Oh, I, I, I recommend it. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very short book. The book emerged during the period of the Gulf, uh, not the Gulf War, um, when we were invading, I believe, uh, ir um, Iraq. Uh, and and um, it emerged when, uh, you know, there was, where, when news coverage, where the only real good uh, informed news w was on the Comedy Central channel, uh, when Stephen Colbert invented the Colbert Rapport. Um, and his first word, you may recall, the first word of the day was truthiness, which is a word that's neither true nor false, but kind of smells like truth, but isn't really. Well, Frankfurt writes this book in, during this time, during this period. And I'm just going to let you listen to him, and I'm going to try to pa parallel what he's saying with this ideals, ideology, intelligence. What is your theory of bullshit? What is bullshit? Well, 
It consists in a, in a lack of concern for the difference between truth and falsity. The motivation of the bullshitter is not to say things that are true or even to say things that are false, but he's serving some other purpose. And the question of whether what he says is true or false is really irrelevant to his pursuit of that ambition. The bullshitter is not necessarily a liar. What he says may very well be true, and he may uh, not think that it's false. I, I was careful to try to uh, make a distinction between, make, make clear the differences, as I understand it, between bullshitters and liars. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it seems not so compelling and not so complicated, but it's actually a rather interesting idea that he has. He says that basically there, there, are, there are people who tell the truth, and there are people who are liars, and then there are these people called bullshitters. The people who, who tell the truth, of course, know the truth so that they can actually tell it. Liars also know the truth. They just cover up the truth. Bullshitters just tell you stuff without any regard to whether it's true or not. So they're, so they're just not interested in whether it's true or not. They're simply trying to tell you something. Essentially, they're trying to, you know, feed you a line. You know, they're trying to sell you something. They're trying to encourage you to follow them, to believe in something, without, without regard whatsoever to things that are, are true um, or false. Um, I want to uh, get back around. Now, there is, there is, of course, a, what is your a, a, an incredibly positive way to think about bullshit, which, um, which, in which he, he, talks, uh, he talks about this quite a lot. And there's a really interesting article, article written, there's a review article written by Larry Leeford, who's one of the founders of the D School at Stanford. And he says that actually BSing is an incredibly important concept. Because it's basically, you know, there's a BS session where what you do is you sit around and you suspend kind of all belief in what really is true and you speculate. So there's a positive aspect to this speculative way of thinking. And I think that's what intelligence is about. So let me, let me try, to, try to go through this very, very quickly. Um, if, 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 if philosophy is interested in absolute truth, and ideology is interested in critiquing that truth to try to find something even more fundamental. Intelligence is about something completely, completely different. And it's not, it's not, a, it's not, it's not about AI. It's not about storing immense amounts of knowledge or information. It's, in fact, about something else. This is a book written by Jeff Hawkins some years ago. Jeff Hawkins is the guy, he, he invented the Palm Pilot, invented the software, the device, everything. And then he, after he did that and made a lot of money, he went back and he studied the brain. And he did a PhD in, um, in neurobiology. And what he discovered were, and you can read this and I'll just summarize it. He discovered um, that intelligence is about something else. It's about pattern recognition and storage, and it's about prediction. So he, sa he says basically intelligence is a way of storing uh, patterns and knowledge uh, in the brain and projecting those into the world, predicting, and when those are projected into the world and, it accord, and, it, and, and what it projects in, into the world doesn't accord with those patterns, new information is added, which means that knowledge is not storing some absolute fixed universal thing. Knowledge is more like a wiki. It's more like projecting, writing new information. Yeah. So it's a constant rewriting, constant production of new knowledge. It's a, it's, a, it's a speculative form of knowledge. There's another kind of parallel version of this called spreadsheet way of knowledge. In, in 1971, VisiCalc, the first uh, uh, digital um, spreadsheet was invented and in many ways produced a, 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 a really good example of what Stephen Levy in an article later called spreadsheet way of knowledge. This guy uh, Michael Schrake has written a lot about this. Uh, basically, it's this. It's about knowledge that's plausible. It's neither true nor false. It's kind of like bullshit except the good side of it. Knowledge that is uh, neither true nor false to this extent. What you get with a digital spreadsheet for the very first time is a way to, uh, let's say you have a company, I have a company, and we're gonna, you're going to sell it. In the old-fashioned way, your accountants and my accountants would have to sit together for five or six days and go over the books and then we would come to some kind of price and we would understand what it is. But of course, if that, if that company was an oil company, that the, the price of the company could change overnight. So what a, what a digital spreadsheet allows you to do 
is to project into the future and to speculate and to create a form of knowledge that's plausible. It's neither true nor false. It could be true. So the value of this company could be this based on the price of oil today. It could be this. So it's a, it's a, it's a, again, it's a speculative form of knowledge. This is, a, this is a, another kind of example of that. It's a, it's a, it's a short piece in Bloomberg Business Week from, from about two weeks ago. It's, a, it's really, it's an argument, it's an, it's an assertion that, um, um, or it's, 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 a, it's a piece about McLaren, the F1 team. And it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a piece that really suggests that McLaren has moved way beyond um, the world of auto racing. Because one of the things, of course, you probably know that with telemetry, uh, an F1 car is like a car in the world, but it's an information gathering device. And it's shooting information constantly back to headquarters as the cars spin around. And what, what's happening is that information goes back into a kind of a central headquarters. And constantly they're speculating about plausible things that could happen to the car. And they cause all kinds of strategic changes about how you change tires, et cetera. What's happening with, um, uh, with McLaren now is that they're, they're using all of their data systems and their knowledge producing and speculative kind of models uh, to work on healthcare and a whole variety of other industries. And so basically what they're doing is focusing on knowledge and the production of knowledge and, uh, and, and, and knowledge that's not really confined to an industry. What, what I, what I want to uh, suggest is, is this, is that um, if, we, if we look at this model of, ide uh, of, of modernity, post-modernity, super-modernity, we, I, I want to argue that we live in this third world, a world where fixed knowledge, where ideology, where universal truths no longer obtain. Um, and what is so what would, what would an architectural practice look like uh, that engaged in that? I think, if you, I, I think uh, the, the UN Studio office is an, offers an incredibly uh, important example of this. Uh, especially if you look at their, if their, at their idea of design models. Um, some years ago, when they reformed the office as UN Studio, they said, look, we, uh, if you look back at all of our work, if you, ca if you, if you um, catalog all of our work, um, every, every drawing, every model, everything, what we see is that there are basically um, one, two, there are like nine design models that everything that we do could be cataloged under. And so, and so what they've done is they've made a kind of a pattern analysis of all of their production. And they've said there are basically nine patterns. There are these nine design models. And instead of designing new projects, when we get a commission or when we enter a competition, we use one of these design models as a way to start the competition. And basically what, the, what these design models are are kind of congealed forms of knowledge, they're congealed forms of, of intelligence, they're congealed forms of design intelligence. Um, so these are some inclusive principle, mathematical model, V model. These are just, these are uh, design model diagrams. It's an incredible essay uh, that was published, uh, this is design models in, 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 in a book of the, of the same title. It's, a, it's maybe eight or nine years ago now. My question now is, um, if, if, if REM was, let's say, the, the pioneer at the beginning of the postmodern period and discovered in Manhattan this ideology that drove practice for 30 or 40 years and drove a kind of a vanguard practice, what would a new practice look like um, that, uh, that lives in the world of intelligence and not in the world of ideals or end of ideology. Um, what would a young REM look like today? Well, it might look like this guy. You may know this chess player. He's, uh, he's the world champion now. Um, and I think a lot, of his, a lot of his skills or a lot of his, the way in which he plays chess is driven by a model not unlike this model of intelligence. I want to say there, is a, there, is a, there are many practices out there that look like this. Um, practices that are driven uh, not by this old-fashioned version of modernization nor by ideology, but by something something new. And this is I'm going to read just a little bit, if you don't mind. 
This is, a, 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 this is an architect. I don't know if you know the work of this, of this architect. His name is Andrew Bromberg. Um, Bromberg um, grew up in the Northwest. Uh, he, he went to a number of different schools, SciArc among them, I think University of Washington, and he ended up um, about 10, 12 years ago, 15 years, 13 years ago, at ATIS uh, in Hong Kong. And I, I think Bromberg really offers an example of a new kind of model of practice and a new kind of design mind that's very different than the one that we see uh, that's focused on the, es the essential truths of architecture, which is the ideals of modernism, or uh, one that's driven um, by uh, the ideological models that we saw from the 60s to the 90s. I think, I think Bromberg's practice and his approach to architecture is one that's driven much more um, by, by intelligence. And I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna read just a little bit of something I've written uh, about Bromberg. And it's, and it's also, and, uh, so what I wanna try to do in, in, in this last bit here, um, and I, I, it, this, won't, this is only like a page, is tie up a lot of these dates and tie up a lot of these critiques into what I believe is a positive model of a practice going forward. Um, so if you, if, if um, the 2008 uh, Beijing Summer Olympics marked the beginning of a period of global economic restructuring in which economic power and development shifted from Europe and the US uh, to Asia, Russia, and the United Emirates uh, and other developing markets. Though many of us saw on our television screens um, the new office and residential uh, towers, the sport facilities, the sparkling new infrastructure. We saw all of that on our TVs in Beijing. We saw all that, but we could not comprehend what it meant because all we could see occurring in Beijing was an extension of what had already occurred in Europe and the US. What we were incapable of comprehending was that the world was not flat, as Thomas Friedman had so famously pronounced, and the world is flat, written in 2005. His account of how globalization was recreating the world in the image of the West, flattening city, regional, and national economic differences into uniform American sameness. From Europe and America, we could not see that the world economy was then, as it has always been, developing unevenly in different places at different times and at different speeds, placing different demands on all who live and work there. Rather than yet another stage of Western modernization, 2008 marked instead the onset of a distinctly new expression of global modernization driven by an unprecedented demand for quantity and the desire for speed. I think that marks, so I, if, you look at, if you look at Rem Koolhaas's work and the work of OMA um, and their work in China, what you see basically is, is precisely what Rem found horrifying in those two comparisons of, mo of modernism from 1914 to 2014. What you see is a form of architecture that he discovers in Manhattan that he extrapolates to Europe that becomes the Zubruger Maritime Terminal, that becomes a variety of the projects they build. Of course, they, they never actually build one like this uh, precisely in the States. Um, um, and in fact, what you see happen uh, both in Beijing and in Shenzhen and in other places that OMA's built buildings uh, is essentially a kind of ideological reproduction of a European form of modernism that's transplanted into Asia. I think with Bromberg, we see something very, very, very different. Um, had anyone watching uh, the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics on television or computer screen look carefully, they might have caught a glimpse of North Star, of the North Star mixed-use development, a smart pair of 100-meter uh, uh, commercial and retail towers and among the first completed buildings designed by Andrew Bromberg, one of the most talented architects to have found uh, his design stride in, an, on this new speed uh, and quantity-driven frontier of global modernization, that is China. Trained in the US, Bromberg began to work more than just 10 years ago in Hong Kong office of, uh, of global architecture giant ATIS. Bromberg was hired specifically to elevate the design profile of ATIS and was given the opportunity to work with clients uh, and in context mostly of his own choosing. This rather prescient decision by Keith Griffiths, chairman of Hong Kong office, has resulted 
and the creation of the, pro of the prototypical architecture practice of the future, in my view. Extremely talented, committed design talent guided by a brilliant, charismatic design hand supported by the technical, financial, and managerial resources of a 500-plus member office in Hong Kong and a global network of thousands. Shaped by demand for quantity and speed, Bromberg's design intelligence has been sharpened and refined by the almost incomprehensible number of competition and design projects he has guided over the last 10 years. Um, soon after his arrival at ATIS, Bromberg began to enter and win numerous competitions in China. But Bromberg and his team were also designing, uh, were beginning to design work in the United Arab Emirates. And there they found a very different design challenge. Whereas in China, the prototyping exercise of competitions allowed Bromberg to develop a catalog of invaluable design knowledge. In the UAE, where the market was highly speculative and developer-driven, this kind of knowledge was less important than the initial design concept expressed in a sketch or image. After Bromberg decided to enter uh, competitions in the UAE, he set out to design a fictional catalog of towers to include in a competition brochure. These are all towers that Bromberg has designed. and I think he's built now 11 towers in the UAE. Reality, however, outpaced fiction. Before Bromberg could begin the catalog, he entered a competition to design the corporate headquarters uh, of the developer DAMAC in Dubai. He had only three hours to make the initial design and one week to refine and revise it once approved. Even so, he and his team won the competition. Um, the, the DAMAC project is emblematic of the time demands placed on almost all of the projects uh, Broom, uh, Bloom, Bromberg and his team design. Designing at speed is not exceptional, it's expected. His team, in fact, seems to delight in the challenges presented by the time constraints placed on all their projects. The pace in Bromberg studio requires rapid and numerous iterations. Experiment, failure, experiment, success, experiment, failure, experiment, success. The failure rate is high, but so too is the rate of learning and knowledge creation, and so then the rate of success. Bromberg also gives his team a great deal of freedom to follow their own design interests within the studio and learn new skills. His team is almost an extension of Bromberg's design intelligence. Both his knowledge base and the means by which knowledge is produced, codified, shared, and utilized. Bromberg's real genius, however, is his ability to very quickly make decisions that retain their integrity while undergoing numerous changes. Rather than develop numerous iterations of a similar design, as is more common, Bromberg instead sketches a single strong design idea that is altered as required. This approach has proven invaluable uh, in the many fast track projects in the UAE, as was the case in the design of um, Ocean Heights 1, a swirling 300 uh, meter uh, squared, uh, me uh, 300 meter uh, residential tower completed in Dubai in 2010. After Bromberg won the competition, the developer wanted an additional 10 floors and required renderings the next day uh, so that they could begin selling the units the following week. When you do a competition of this kind, Bromberg observed in an interview in 2007, you better get it right the first time. Bromberg has already designed and will and build some of the most important new buildings uh, in this part of the world, and he's still very young. What is even more impressive, and indeed is likely the expression of a new kind of design genius that could only have emerged at this time and in this place, is the design mind of Andrew Bromberg. It is, in fact, what sets him apart even from the Starkitects against whom he now matches his hand. Bromberg's early ex uh, competition experiences in China gave him a way to think designs and indeed entire buildings as prototypes where each created a new design knowledge that, in turn, helped him more quickly and more skillfully design the next. Bromberg also thinks designs parametrically, a skill he honed with the many to towers he designed in the Emirates. He has an almost preternatural ability to see hundreds of design moves ahead. More recently, especially uh, in the projects he's now designing in Singapore, and this is one that's completed, he seems to have put these two halves of his design mind together, one cannot help but believe that these two ways of thinking design, both proto pro, um, prototyping and parametrically, are connected and mutually reinforcing. That Bromberg's constantly changing uh, body of design knowledge enables the speed of thought necessary to see that far ahead 
while such foresight reciprocally enables the rapid creation of new design knowledge that, in turn, allows for even greater speed of thought. So maybe just to, just to kind of come, come full circle, I, I, I find Bromberg's design approach incredibly compelling um, because unlike the, unlike the modernists who were trying to discover universal truths, and unlike the postmodernists like everyone uh, from uh, Stern and Portuguese through Eisenman and Jeff Kipnis and Greg Lynn, even now to Rem Koolhaas and certainly Zaha Hadid uh, and Patrick Schumacher, who are looking for ideological replacements for modernism that themselves are kinds of truths that they find in existing um, disciplines or in the case of Koolhaas in, the, uh, you know, in New York itself. Bromberg produces his own knowledge. Um, and I think it's very much the same uh, case with you in studio, and it's the same, uh, uh, yeah, it's certainly the same with, with the design models. Um, Bromberg um, emerged and was produced in this climate in China and, and now, in, you know, beginning in India as well, um, where quantity and speed are required in a way that just simply were not, have not been the case uh, in Western Europe uh, and in North America. So, so what I find compelling about Bromberg is the, 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 the model he offers for a very different and compelling practice and design protocol where the relationship between thought and action is one um, that's continuously being uh, evolved and produced and one in which um, uh, a single uh, initial design um, uh, sketch or drawing uh, is very powerful and can hold under lots and lots and lots of parametric changes. And both of things, those things are possible because of the enormous number of competitions he's done and because of the in, in China and because of the enormous number of towers um, I think that he developed and had to do so with this particular skill of being able to see many, many moves ahead, very much like a chess player. So um, I think we're, we, we are beginning to see um, a whole different kind of post-avant-garde architecture design mind um, that's no longer uh, dependent on or driven by or obsessed by producing universal truths or, or finding things outside the discipline, other forms of, of, of knowledge that uh, one brings in and is the motivation, either discovered things like the, the culture of congestion or in Eisenman's case, slime molds and Chomsky and linguistics and everything else. I think what is exciting about a Bromberg um, is uh, he and his uh, team produce and reproduce constantly their own design knowledge, their own design intelligence, and it doesn't come really um, from, from outside. So, I hope we will begin to see more examples of this. I'm quite sure we will. But I think, we've, I think we have left a certain paradigm of architecture and architecture avant-garde. Um, and I think, I think this Venice Biennale has helped us mark the end of that. Um, and I think uh, we are on the edge of, of a whole new uh, set of practices and a whole new um, yeah, in, in, in a new kind of horizon that's driven much more by intelligence and actionable knowledge um, than, than it will be by ideology or ideals. That's it. Thank you. Of course, of course I can take questions. I, I, I mean, there can only be questions after that much stuff. Uh, I apologize for all the charts, but it's the only way to really tell, tell that story. How do you do questions? Do, you, do people ask them or, I, or they just hold their hands up? And, or have I just terrified everyone who <laughs> bored you into tears and so you have no questions? Yes. Uh, so earlier when you mentioned about the, the truth, you tell the truth, mm. you tell the lie, yeah. the middle. Yeah. Mm. 
it's <clears throat> so um, I, I'm arguing that it's it's an architecture that is driven by the production of intelligence, um, <clears throat> and so uh, let me go back to the liars, truth tellers, bullshitter sort of uh, model and example. When when Harry Frankfurt wrote the book, he was uh, very critical. Um, he's a moral philosopher, right? So he was he was very upset that. Uh, he was living through a period of time where it seemed that the truth just didn't matter to anyone anymore, right? And so, um, uh, and so he writes this analysis, and for him, the bullshitter is a negative character. It's a negative character because the bullshitter um, has no interest in truth, is th simply interested in essentially selling you something, selling you a line, right? Getting you to believe something and you follow them. I want to say that that that, that negative characterization uh, of bullshitters is precisely what ideologists are. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in my paradigm, and let's say the modern, postmodern, supermodern paradigm, I would say that that both liars and truth tellers are on the modernist side. Yeah, because they know truth. They either tell it or they conceal it. In this middle world, from the 60s to the 90s. That's a world where if you, look at, if you look at philosophy, if you look at architecture, if you look at any discipline, the, the, the belief that there was some essential understanding that we had of architecture or of the novel um, or of universal truth was critiqued uh, and, and obliterated, essentially. And so what, what those truths were replaced with were ideologies, postmodernism. Postmodernism is an ideology, post dash modern style. Um, whether it's Venturi, whether it's Stern, whether it's Jenks, it's a style, it's an ideology. Parametricism is an ideology. Patrick Schumacher doesn't say that this is what we do in our office, parametricism, and this and, and you should maybe consider it. He says the work all architecture must become parametricism. Yeah. This is the universal global style. So, it's an, so, so in my view, that's an ideology. I think there is, on the other hand, let's say, a positive appraisal of the, the bullshitter category. And this article that I alluded to, written by Larry Liefert, who started the D School, he's suggesting this as well. He's saying the BS session, the bullshit session, is a session where people suspend their interest in the truth, yeah? and what they do is they speculate about things that might be true, things that could be true, things that are plausible. Um, they are neither true nor false, and that's what I was trying to suggest by that idea of the, of the spreadsheet way of knowledge. It's neither true nor false, it's speculative. If you, if you, if you look, for example, at what you do in an architecture studio, um, you're given a brief, um, and in fact, every project that's produced from that brief is a speculation about what this building would look like if this and this and this and this were the constraints or the parameters of the brief. So, in a way, every studio project is a prototype. Yeah? And so, the, so, 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 so my argument is prototyping is a way to produce knowledge. And it's a way, for example, that UN Studio produces an entire body of knowledge that they call design models that then they draw on. The difference between Van Berkel's models and Kuhlhaus's delirious New York generated idea of bigness that becomes an ideology is that it doesn't come from the outside. Models are produced internal to the practice itself of UN Studio. So it's a knowledge base that's produced in a speculative way that's cataloged and then that's used later for projects. It's produced internally, it's not external. So, so I would say that a practice like Bromberg's is, <clears throat> is, is one driven by intelligence because it very much like the UN Studio model, um, is, I think he's able and his team is, they are able to take on the kind of projects that they do because they produce an enormous body of design knowledge 
through the prototyping that they did in all the competitions that they, that they did in China. They did probably 60 competitions, um, and they won you know, 15 or 20 of them and didn't build maybe a few of them. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that, is that that's a practice based on the production of design knowledge that then is repurposed and used in the way that UN Studio uses models. But I think what's, what's, different, than, what's different about Bromberg than even UN Studio is that Bromberg has, and he's developed this, this in, his, in, his, in his team, a, a kind of an ability to see four or five or 10 or 20 moves, like, in a, like, in a, chess, like a chess player in advance and to create initial design schemas that, with, that, let's say, withstand the changes and transformations that a lot of those towers that he designed in the Emirates had to undergo. When you make a, an initial design and they say, oh, can you add 10 more floors to this, the, the, the initial design um, party has to have a, a, a kind of flexibility and a kind of built-in mm, ability to be resilient. And he has a very weird ability, it seems to me, to both speculatively see 20 or 30 moves in advance, but also because they built up this incredible design knowledge base, um, the, these two things, I think, um, reinforce each other. So, so I, think, I, th I, think, I, think, I think there's something really fascinating, so for me, there's something fascinating about Bromberg's approach um, that's not ideological, that's not high modernist, that's not postmodern, um, that's not driven by space or time, but that's driven almost entirely by speed and the need to deal with quantity. Sure. Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, it's 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 uh, that's but but you're making my point precisely. They are not knowledge you can use. They are knowledge they produce that they use. You have to produce knowledge. You have to. Pro I mean, that's part of that's part of what's compelling about this. Bromberg is not taking a formula. He's not taking a style. He's not taking an ideology and using that to make buildings. They are producing, like you in studio did, their own knowledge base for which they, I mean, which they then use to develop projects. Um, no, I just showed buildings, of course. I just was showing examples of buildings. If you go to their studio, you see, you know, an accumulation of incredible sort of research, um, and it's 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 a knowledge base. Um, but no, there there is nothing to extrapolate from what they've done that you can use, except that you should do what they're doing and not look at what they've done and try to reproduce it. Is that does that is that a fair answer? You're not you're not convinced. Okay, maybe somebody else has a question. Yes. Mm. Well, I mean, if, if you look at, um, you know, I, I realized I, I, there was a, a really important slide that got skipped here. Um, it didn't deal with that, but, but I, 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 I left out an incredibly important slide that lays out some of these things. Let me, let me say this. Um, if, if you look right now, if you were to compare um, Patrick Schumacher's idea of parametricism with parametric thinking, then I think you get at some of the difference in relationship between 
let's say, thinking and doing in an ideology and thinking and doing in an intelligence model. L let, me, let me try to explain. So Schumacher, I would say, is an ideologist of parametricism. He says parametricism is a style, yeah? And it's a style that's produced by the parametric tools that they use to design with. So he equates a design tool with a style, yeah? So parametric, so these parametric tools will look like this. I would say that parametric thinking and prototype thinking are the two principal mm, drivers of the production of intelligence. P p uh, prototype thinking is a way of producing, um, you know, of getting a brief, producing, let's say, uh, um, in a studio, a what if. Okay, if this is the site, if this is the material, if, this, if these are the constraints, it would look like that, right? If you understand that prototype as a speculation, as a, as a, not just as a, if you understand it not just as a, uh, let's say, a design, but if you were to understand that design as a, as a let's say, as a, as a form of knowledge, then you make the prototype, then you adjust it, then you make another prototype, right? Then you make another prototype. Each of these iterations of the prototyping exercise itself is the production of a refinement of the design, but it's also the production of a body of knowledge, right? So prototyping is almost by definition a, a production of speculative knowledge that's neither true nor false, but that might be if these are the conditions. And those constant productions add up to create a body of knowledge, I would say. Parametric thinking works similarly, um, you know, in, in, in that, um, well, I would say parametric thinking when it's, when it's partnered with prototype thinking then becomes incredibly, an incredibly powerful um, means of, of, of designing, but it's not a style. Par parametric thinking and parametric thought is not the same as parametricism, which is a style. I think you're probably already doing parametric thinking. You are probably already engaged, and you don't need a digital platform to do parametric thinking, and you don't need, and you don't need, and you don't need, uh, you know, 3D printers or laser cutters to do prototype thinking either. Every time you make a model, you make it a prototype. What's different in the digital paradigm is every move you make is cataloged theoretically in a digital file and can be repurposed, right? So, in other words, you make. 10 moves in, your, in, in the making of a model n in an analog way, yeah, and then you've got the model. But if you make 1,000 moves digitally in a digital paradigm, they're all registered and they all become part of a succeeding and failing process, right, that creates a body of knowledge about how to design this thing. And so, and so I don't, you, you certainly don't need digital tools to do that. But what they enable is a registering and a cataloging and an opportunity to repurpose the production of the knowledge in a way that wasn't possible before digital tools. That's not true. Yeah, I disagree with that to start with, but go on. Okay, so, so, so uh, I, I reference this guy, Michael, Michael Strait. He's written an incredible book about, about a completely different a transformation in the way that we think about prototypes, precisely not that industrial design paradigm, but another paradigm. So, so prototypes are not the, the objects that, 
that sit at the end of a design process. They are not the perfected, yeah. Um, so, prototypes don't. so prototypes don't, prototypes are themselves not the innovation. They are in your model. Prototypes, in fact, are the means by which you produce innovation. So prototypes and prototyping uh, as an exercise is not an exercise to get to a prototype that, th that you then reproduce. The prototype itself is the means of generating knowledge that you then accumulate and that you use in a design process. That's the point. So, so, so prototypes are not an endpoint. They are, they are not the thing. They are not the innovation. They are the drivers of the innovation process itself. If, if in fact you're looking for the prototype to be, yeah, in, in industrial design, but I'm suggesting that prototypes in architecture and in this model of design practice are not the end products. They are in fact the engines of producing knowledge to make many end products. So we, we may disagree about what a prototype is, but you had another point. They do not have a goal in mind. They, if, if, you ha if, you, if, if you, well, they might, and then I, th I would say that you're using prototypes in a very old-fashioned way. That's why you don't like the term. Um, I, I'm suggesting prototypes aren't used and shouldn't be used in that way. They should be used as drivers of innovation and not as endpoints. They're not, yeah. So yes, of if, 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 we, if we were to agree on your definition of prototypes, I wouldn't use prototypes. If we were to agree on my definition of prototypes, then I will continue to use prototypes. So I will continue to use prototypes. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, for thank you. For the lecture and for the